The movie, based on a true story, begins with the smoking of a pipe in a national Indian teepee. Osage tribal elders lament that the youth do not honor their ancestral customs, preferring to consort with the palefaces who have driven them onto reservations. One consolation is that the land is rich in oil, minerals found during the springtime celebration of the time known as the Flower Moon. The oppression of civilization prevents white people from squeezing natural resources the old-fashioned way. Instead, they trade fairly with the Redskins. We appoint specially trained guardians who give Indians incapacitated by civilized laws the money honestly earned from oil sales. In 1919, Ernest Burkhart, a war veteran, arrives in the county. He goes to his uncle, local oligarch William Hale. Mores in those days were not so tolerant, so the uncle clarifies whether young Dimbley likes girls in general and the Indian in particular. He confesses that he likes all women, as long as they're under 26. Hale suggests he look at the local Indian women. They're very wealthy. Why, are some Osages mysteriously prone to dying without trial? Well, these are troubled times. The guy listens to the council, and during the races he meets Molly, a native and heiress to a land rich in black gold. Ernest, who works as a chauffeur, not only drives the girl around, but also makes a pass at her, telling her that he is an Oscar-winning actor and works as a cab driver for fun. In between, spinning the sheep and light flirtation man does not forget to learn the history of the Osage tribe and make with his cousin Brian Banal robbery, lowering the booty on gambling. Charm and persistence bear fruit. Soon Molly invites the boy to dinner, in the course of which Ernest learns that the girl has diabetes. Despite the fact that the reason for his interest, the girl sees in her financial condition, she continues to socialize, accompanying Molly to Sunday service. Ernest meets Bill Smith, the husband of her sister Minnie, whom he and his associates recently robbed in an adult way. Ernest soon proposes to Molly, and a short time later the couple join in holy and legal matrimony. The festivities are marred by illness, with Minnie getting worse and worse every day. Soon she gives her soul to God. Widower Bill asks Ernesto to leave the funeral, as if recalling something. Outside, Uncle Hale explains that Osage women are prone to disease and generally will die often, and tactfully hints that this plays into the heir's hands. Molly hosts a family dinner at her mother's house. She is ill and sees a hallucinating owl. Anna is one of the women's daughters and, being tipsy, has an argument with Brian. Ernest has to take his brother out to defuse the situation. They have a drink in the barn, discussing the murder of another rich Indian. In the evening, Brian volunteers to give a tipsy Anna a ride home. A week later, the sheriff informs Molly that Anna has been found murdered. Ernest takes his wife to identify his sister. With this being the second murder in a short time, the Osage elders convene a council where they decide to inform the authorities of the plot and hire a private investigator to find the killer. Uncle Hale, who was present at the meeting, promises a cash reward to anyone who has useful information on the subject. It's a sad situation. In the capital, an Osage representative who has come to lobby for the tribe's interests has been stabbed to death by two unknown well-wishers named Ernest and Brian. But the detective with a sober outside perspective begins to ask uncomfortable questions. In particular, he is interested in the inheritance of money and land rights between the spouses and the fact that Bill Smith, after Minnie's death, married her sister Rita. The investigation worries Uncle Hale. He asks Ernest to deal with the situation before the situation deals with them. Ernest and Molly already have two children. The condition of the spouse is deteriorating. The doctors prescribe her a new drug, insulin, which is not easy to get. Uncle Hale learns that his nephew is organizing a car theft and insurance fraud behind his back. But the great car thief hired by the great car thief is caught by the police. For such a blunder, the uncle punishes Ernest by literally smacking him on the ass. Hale gives his nephews a new assignment to get rid of a private investigator hired by Osaiji. Ernest and Brian trap the man in a hotel and beat him severely, forcing him to get off the reservation. The next stage of the plan for personal enrichment is to get rid of a competitor in the person of Bill Smith, also claiming a piece of the inheritance. Hale turns to a local bootlegger who employs explosive specialists. As her health deteriorates, Molly's paranoia worsens. She does not trust the doctors who give her injections, suspecting that they are intentionally harming her. The woman asks Ernest to take care of the procedures personally. He loves his wife and therefore agrees. Uncle Hale, being the guardian of the Redskins, ensures the life of Henry, Molly's first husband. Henry suffers from depression outbursts of anger caused by an unbearable new wife and in his spare time enjoys alcoholism. He picks a fight with his wife's alleged lover and is scandalized at the bank when they refuse to give him money. 
Molly's mother walks away with the spirits of her ancestors, ending her earthly journey. While the Ritzkins mourn their loss, the mercurial, practical whites figure out who will inherit what. One night at dinner, Hale learns that Ernest and Molly are having a third child, which doesn't sit well with him. On top of that, the insured Henry, being the first husband in theory, can claim the inheritance to solve the problem. Ernest hires John Ramsey, one of the smugglers of illegal moonshine, during a parade in which the Redskins march with the scouts. Ernest introduces the moonshiner to Henry on the grounds of alcoholism Ramsey rubs into the Indian's confidence by luring him into a trap to kill him with a shot to the back of the head. In town, he reports the execution and returns the fallen gun. Ernest reports the death of Molly's ex-husband, which naturally causes her to have another panic attack. But Uncle Hale is not satisfied with the job. Henry's death should have been framed as a suicide from depression aggravated by alcohol, and suicides don't shoot themselves in the back of the head and get rid of the gun. This outcome makes it difficult to get insurance. To be on the safe side, Hale advises his wife's previously beaten lover Henry to leave town, but he refuses. Soon Molly gives birth to her third child. Rita, the last surviving sister, is concerned about her well-being. Despite her medication, she is getting worse and worse. Their husbands are discussing their affairs, but relations between them are heating up. A few days later, Hale gives the go-ahead to settle the Indian question once and for all. He tells Ernest to track down the bomber to begin the mission. The nephew delegates the task to John Ramsey, despite his reluctance to participate. In the evening, when Ernest and Molly are lying in bed, in the bedroom, the windows suddenly fly out from a powerful explosion. The man goes outside to find out what happened. The house next door where Bill and Rita lived has blown up. After ascertaining that they are dead, Ernest with sad news returns to his wife, who with children and banks is hiding in the basement. The next day, Haywyl personally comes to see the task at hand. The sheriff warns him that he has gotten too excited. Such an extravaganza is much harder to keep quiet. And so it turns out the Osage tribe sends a large-scale delegation to Washington, D.C. to personally ask the authorities to investigate a string of suspicious murders and mysterious accidents. Along with them goes seriously Il Mali, who is escorted by Ernest. In the capital, the Indians meet President Coolidge, whom they beg for help, but the politician just uses the usual phrases. At this time, Uncle Hale, together with the local doctors, explains to Ernest that in addition to insulin, he must inject his wife with a special sedative. Everyone is well aware that the capsule actually contains a slow-acting poison, but they are talented at pretending otherwise. Molly rightly assumes that the local doctors are adding something to the medicine, so on their return they ask her husband to personally pick up the insulin from the train. She has no idea that he is more than involved in the whole murder thing. Molly sends her youngest daughter to a relative's house for a change of climate. The girl has lung problems. Later lying in bed, she, like her mother, sees the owl herald of the imminent demise. She recounts the visions to her spouse, who continues to administer injections. At this time, Tom White, an FBI agent sent to investigate Osage's murder, rings the doorbell. He wants to talk to Molly, but Ernest says she's not feeling well. They arrange to meet on Friday, after which the boy goes to his uncle's house on a treasonous trip to put the word out. While White talks to the natives, Uncle Hale methodically and systematically goes about his business. The first thing he wants to do is cash in his insurance. Henry's life is cut short by a lead overdose in his head, but the insurance company prudently sends him to the lead office. At this time, the feds are roaming the town, searching the area, interviewing the residents, and drawing far-reaching conclusions. In particular, they're wondering why no autopsy documents have been kept on Anna. Agent White personally visits Hale while he sits at the barbers. The old man doesn't like the scrutiny of the authorities, but he keeps a low profile. After the feds leave, the uncle makes a fuss, meets with an enforcer to tip off a bank robbery. However, it's a trap, and the police squad is waiting for the gang at the exit. Immediately afterwards, Hale warns the owner of a jewelry store about an impending robbery, to which he himself directed other subordinates. In a shootout, one of the criminals dies. The feds find the smuggler's camp, but they are already gone, and the leader crashed his car into a tree. After being poisoned, Uncle Hale visits Ernest to warn him that he will have the best lawyers if he is arrested. Also, the old man asks his nephew to sign the papers to transfer the inheritance rights. So. Just in case, at night the FBI agents meet in the field to discuss the progress of the investigation. They have managed to find witnesses to Anna's murder, as well as arrest several bandits calling them all on Indian money. The conversation is interrupted by the Scarlet Fire. Uncle Hale's farm is blazing. By a strange coincidence just this afternoon, the old man has insured it for a large sum. Ernest, poisoning his wife with alleged medication, watches the blaze through the window, reveling in the guilt of being wasted. 
The next day, the feds come to arrest him, despite his attempts to cover for his sick wife. Ernest is interrogated for a long time, using elements of psychological and physical torture, forced to stand without sleep. The guy doesn't budge, denying involvement in the crimes, but the agents have several of his associates crack and turn everyone in. The FBI allows Ernest to talk to one of them alone to finally induce cooperation. Tom White appeals to Ernest's family feelings, after which he rats out Ramsey, who in turn is ready to pull the rest of the customers. In exchange for testimony, the feds save Molly, who was visited by Hale in an unconscious state. The girl never realized if he was real or a hallucination. Molly is taken to the hospital, where she gets better after detoxification. Hale shows up at the sheriff's office to turn himself in. Barely, the feds put out an APB on him. In his cell, he builds a defense tactic while the prosecutor interviews the others involved. Soon the hearing begins. The prosecution's main witness is Ernest, Hale's attorney, who looks like he's killed and eaten a weaker lawyer, demands a private interview with the witness on the grounds that Ernest is also his client. Ernest agrees, whereupon the hearing is adjourned. In the afternoon, the feds turn him over to his wife and cousin Brian. In the evening, the guy goes to a bar to meet with a lawyer. Many influential people are waiting for him there, providing support for Uncle Hale. The lawyer persuades Ernest to change his testimony, say he was tortured and pressured. Then the whole family will support him and get him out of jail. Giving in to the promise, Ernest refuses to go back on his word. Agent White arrests him and tells him that his youngest daughter is dead. Perhaps the reason is the poison that the local doctors gave Molly before she became pregnant. Ernest is released for the funeral, after which he once again changes his testimony and decides to testify again for a chance to stay with his wife and children. At the trial, Ernest testifies against his uncle, confessing to many crimes, including the fact that he met Molly at his instigation. But in the end, feelings take over. After the meeting, he talks to his wife and asks about the children. Ernest never admits to her that he deliberately poisoned her with the injections, realizing that he is lying Molly silently leaves. The movie ends with a radio play about the fate of the participants in these events. Hale received a life sentence but got out early thanks to politicians he knew and died alone in a nursing home. His nephew, despite the deal, also received a life sentence but was released for good behavior. Molly found a new husband. She died of diabetes in 1937 and was buried next to her father, mother, sisters, and daughter. The Osage tribe still inhabits their new land and holds regular powwows. Traditional National Dance Gatherings 